Our scripture reading today is from Job chapter 9, verses 25 through 35. My days are swifter than a runner. They fly away without a glimpse of joy. They skim past like boats of papyrus, like eagles swooping down on their prey. If I say, I will forget my complaint, I will change my expression and smile. I still dread all my sufferings, for I know you will not hold me innocent. Since I am already found guilty, why should I struggle in vain? Even if I wash myself with soap and my hands with washing soda, you would plunge me into a slime pit so that even my clothes would detest me. He is not a man like me that I might answer him, that we might confront each other in court. If only there were someone to arbitrate between us, to lay his hand upon us both, someone to remove God's rod from me so that his terror would frighten me no more. Then I would speak up for fear of him. But as it now stands with me, I cannot. The word of the Lord. Children are dismissed if you'd like to head out to Children's Church. They leave the mic here because they think I'm trustworthy. I'm not. I move too much. Now, if you've been tracking with us as we have walked through the book of Job thus far, you'll remember that pretty early in, I told you that early in the book of Job, his laments are pretty dark. (laughs) They just get darker. But that his understanding of the gospel, the good news, is just a a faint glimmer early. It's the further that we work into the book, the more that it's like Job as he is talking, and he's talking more at, at God than to God, but the more he starts talking about those glimmers of hope, the more they become these beacons of light that just illuminate the darkness for Job which is a nice way of saying the further we go, the better it gets. And we're getting to the good stuff. Now, where we are right here in, uh, in chapter 9, in the part that Gail just read for us, uh, Job is telling us um, basically the two options he sees for how he can address the separation that he feels. Okay? Now, catch me. Job is not actually separated from God, right? If you, you know the beginning of the story, you were here when we started looking at this, you remember that God is literally in heaven looking down at Job and saying, that guy's my favorite, right? The Lord is in heaven going, I, I love him. He is my servant. He is faithful to me. Job isn't separated from God, but he feels like he is. He feels like God is an utter stranger and uh, he's a stranger to God. So Job says, I got, I got two options for how to deal with this separation and the sorrow that is just present because life hurts. He's going to say there's two of them and that they both stink and he really wishes that the third option could be true, right? So we're just going to go through this fast because Gail just read it for us and you're super smart. So he said, here's the first one. Job said, here's my first thing I can do to deal with the separation and I can deal with the sorrow. I can just resign myself. This is how life is. So actually what he said is, and I swear, church folk, this is like our favorite. Because Job said, what I'll do is I'll slap a smile on my face. And when people ask me, how you doing? How's your walk with the Lord? How you handling life? We're going to say, what does every church person say when people ask you on Sunday mornings how you are? I'm fine or blessed. I love it. Yes, I'm good. Job said that's option one. I can just resign myself to the fact that God and I have an estranged relationship. And it's just not going to get better. And life hurts. And that just is what it is. So suck it up, buttercup. Put on a smile and go. There's option one. Now Job says that option stinks. Because it doesn't actually do a thing about the separation. He still feels a million miles away from God, smile or not. 
That means he sits in a pew and he sings the song because the person next to you will notice if you don't and feels nothing. And he reads the scripture because you're supposed to show up to church and he listens to the preacher and sits there and on the inside goes, this is stupid, when are we done? And none of it touches the sorrow. Some of us only ever pick this option. Option two, Job says, is he can reform himself. Right, and you catch the language he uses. Job says, here's what I can do. I can scrub the sin out of my life. Right, he talks about, like, if I take lie, and, and he uses this image, like, if I just scrub really, 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 really hard, and I try to reform so that I am magically a much better version of me than I was, maybe God will like me again. And, of course, the implication is if God likes me again, then the suffering won't happen, right? Because if you're good, bad things aren't supposed to happen. Now, some of us try this option, too, right? Hurt happens, or we feel really separated from God, and we just say, I guess he doesn't like me. I'm going to work harder, be better, do more. But that option stinks, too, my friends. Actually, Job says it literally stinks. I love the image. He said, I can scrub all that I want, and at the end of the day, I'm still so sinful that he kind of flips the image ever... Um, worked really, 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 really hard outside and like your clothes are just nasty, right? And you get home and you say, I got to get these off. And Job says, nope, I am so sinful that my clothes go, I got to get off Job. This option doesn't work either. Because at the end of the day, this option leaves me wondering, what do I have to do to not feel separated from God? Like, and what happens if I mess up? And what is this? This doesn't do anything about sorrow, except to make me feel like I got what I got because of what I did. Job says, I don't like either of these. I wish there was a third option. And what he wishes for is, he says, I wish that instead of trying to resign myself and reform myself, I could rest in the work of a redeemer. And it's a cool image. Because what the Hebrew literally says is, Job says, I wish that there was someone who could put his hand on me and put his hand on God and stand between the two of us. I wish there was someone who could come before God and testify about me in such a way that God's heart would be turned towards me. Because Job doesn't feel like it is. And he said, I wish that someone could stand between the two of us and testify to me about God so that I'll stop believing lies. He says, I wish there was a redeemer who would stand between the two of us. Now, this is a sidebar, but think about what Job is saying. No human being can do that. Right? Job just said, I wish God would stand between me and God. But he ends the passage that Gail read for us by going, that's a pipe dream. It's not true. I'm stuck with these two options. Now, for Job, early, because this is chapter 9, those glimmers of the gospel are just glimmers. They're ones he, he can't even believe. It's like life just hurts too much. The separation too, feels too intense. The sorrow is too extreme. But the deeper you go into Job's laments, like by chapter 16, Job will say things like, I think there actually might be a redeemer in heaven. I think he's in heaven advocating, testifying about me to God the Father. But he's way up there, and that doesn't change squat here. But by chapter 19, Job says, I, I think there is a redeemer. I think there is someone who puts one hand on me and one hand on God. I think he's doing it right now. And I think it changes everything. And so, as I was praying for today, I thought we could do a full 30 minutes where I just try to convince everyone that resigning yourself and reforming yourself, bad plan. But I'd rather just deal with number three. So here's all we're going to talk about today, because I think you probably already know the first two aren't that great. We're going to jump from chapter 9. We're going to go to chapter 19, because I want you to see that there is, in fact, a Redeemer. There is someone who puts one hand on you and one hand on God the Father, that God stands between you and God, and that this particular Redeemer heals your separation and sorrow both the actual separation that we have from God and the stuff that we as believers feel. And he heals that separation and sorrow through a tender testimony and a total triumph, both of which point to 
a tremendous truth. So let's just unpack this together. We're going to be in 19. If you want to go ahead and turn there, you're more than welcome to. We're going to be in chapter 19. Uh, We're going to start in verse 23, and we'll work our way down through verse 27. These are some of the most famous uh, words in the whole book of Job. They're like the only ones that will appear and etched on anything in Hobby Lobby, okay? Just saying. These are good ones. But Job starts out this way. Uh, Here in chapter 19, verse 23, he says, Oh, that my words were recorded that they were written on a scroll. No, that's not good enough. That they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead. Still not good enough. That they were engraved in rock forever. Now, what is our poet getting at? (laughs) Job, in its context here in chapter 19, is saying that he wishes, with everything that he has, that he could give some testimony about himself. Right? It was written on a scroll for God to come read. Or it was engraved uh, on, on, with lead. And, and he says, well, that's not good enough. I wish it could just be engraved, etched into, hammered into rock, last forever, and that God would come down, read my testimony, engraved on this rock, and his heart would become tender towards me. Job says, I wish that I had words, that if I just gave my testimony about my life, it would change the way God views me. Now, you and I both know that ain't going to work. Think about it in your own world. If I, I, won't, I won't make you chisel. If I just handed you, you know, a laptop and I said, I want you to write your personal testimony. I want you to write it out and we're going to give it to God and your testimony is going to turn his heart. You would have to get creative in your writing because there'd be whole chapters in your world that you'd have to edit out right? You know, there are all the stuff that we've talked about, like if we threw it on the screen right now, you would just die. You're not edging that because you would know that won't turn God's heart. And yet it's almost like Job goes, that doesn't really matter. Because the very next sentence, he abandons the idea that his testimony can change God's heart. And he heads this way. He says, I know. I know that I know that I know that my Redeemer is alive. Now, this sentence is beautiful and powerful. Redeemer, in the Old Testament, is a technical, theologically loaded term. So, if you're familiar with the book of Ruth, probably the simplest, most straightforward example, Boaz serves as Redeemer to Naomi and Ruth. Because in the Old Testament, this specific word here in Hebrew that gets translated as redeemer refers to someone who is connected to you by covenant, okay? Not by contract. Contract says, you know, I am connected to Mara until she annoys me. I'm connected to her until she breaks her end or I break my end, and then we both part ways, right? Covenant would say, I am connected to her no matter what. And the covenant tie that a redeemer commits to, it was normally with a family member, says that that redeemer is obligated to fight your battles when you can't fight them. That redeemer is going to provide when you don't have something. The redeemer will stand when you can't. This redeemer matters. And Job says, I know something. I have a redeemer, he's mine, and he lives He lives longer than my words ever can. He lives for all of eternity. Now that's awesome. But what in tarnation has it got to do with the first sentence? You know, why does it matter? But Job says, I wish I had a testimony engraved on a rock that would turn God's heart, that would make God's heart towards me tender. And then he just abandons that because he knows he doesn't have one. And all of a sudden he says, the only thing that matters is I've got a redeemer and he lives. Do you know why it matters? because of what was engraved on the Redeemer. Isaiah 49 is a prophecy written by the prophet Isaiah, and in Isaiah 49, he is speaking on behalf of the people of Israel. Now, the people of Israel are separated and feeling incredible sorrow about their relationship with God. Now, in Job's case, he feels separation and sorrow, and he didn't do anything. In Israel's case, they feel separation and sorrow because they did a boatload of very bad things they would not want etched into rock, okay? 
And Israel is lamenting in Isaiah 49 that they feel forgotten and forsaken. They feel abandoned and assaulted. Right? They feel exactly what Job feels. And Isaiah 49, God speaks to the people of Israel, and he says this really beautiful thing. He says this, Isaiah 49, verse 16, he says, See, I can't forget you, because I have engraved you on the palm of my hand. Okay? So Isaiah 49, we've got people who feel like God is separated, that he's far, far away from them, that he's assaulting them, he's forgotten them, and God uses this really cool image. He says, how the heck could I forget you? You are engraved on the palm of my hand. It was anthropomorphic language. Please do not think that God is up there like with a sharpie. But he says, that's the equivalent of saying, how could I possibly forget about you? Every single time I look at my hand, your name is written on it. And I remember that I have a covenant tie to you. I remember, Israel, that no matter what you do, I won't forget you, forsake you, abandon you, or assault you, ever. Your name is written on my hand. That was beautiful. It was kind of weird, right? I mean, if it did say, I have written you on the palm of my hand, I would go, that's cool, I get that. God, Sharpie, got it. If it said, your name is tattooed on the palm of my hand, I would think, strange choice, but I understand what we're saying. But the word literally is engraved. The Hebrew word means to dig deep or to cut. I've dug you in the palm of my hand. But that doesn't make any sense until you hit a cross, right? Until you hit the cross where God has been engraved, where his skin was dug into, where he looks every time and says, I see you and how much I love you in a nail-scarred hand. I want you to think about Job for a minute. Chapter 9, Job said, I wish with everything within me that there was someone, anyone, who could stand between me and God, whose testimony about me to God would make God's heart tender towards me. I wish there was someone who could testify to me about God and would turn my heart back to him. And in chapter 9, he said, there can't possibly be one. In chapter 16, he said, oh no, there is one. He's my redeemer. And guys, I need you to picture what Job couldn't picture. We're going to drive the live stream crazy. Ready? Because what Job says is that he said, I want someone who can stand between me and God. Right? And if, I'm just going to pick on her all day. She'll, I'll pay for it later. If, if Mara stands on her own and says she's going to etch, engrave her own testimony, hey God, turn your heart, make it tender towards me, that's not going to work. But what the Bible says is that she is a redeemer who stands between she and her father. And his nail-scarred hand, which is engraved with her name and your name, is one hand on her and one hand on God the Father. Which means that every single time the father looks at Mara, he looks through an engraved hand. He looks through the sign that says, she's mine. He looks through the hand that says, it doesn't matter what she's done or didn't do, I paid for it. It's done. He looks through the hand that says, I chose her. Which means that it's her testimony doesn't mean squat. But Jesus' testimony about her that says, I engraved her in the palm of my hand, means everything. And that's what makes the Father's heart always and ever tender towards her and tender towards you. But friends, it also means that on those days, if you're a Christian, when you feel separated from your God and you are wondering, has he forgotten me or forsaken me? Has he abandoned me? Is he assaulting me? You need to know there is a Redeemer that stands between you and the Father. A Redeemer who lives and who lives with nail-scarred, engraved hands. And when you look at the Father, you need to look through the Redeemer's hand. And you need to be reminded that the Father, who sometimes we question whether he cares or is present or anything like that, gave his Son for you. That's who your Redeemer is. Does that make sense? Now, i got to keep moving, but some of you don't have to move with me. Because some of us, that's the only thing you need to hear today. You have a Redeemer who lives. And his testimony about you is tender because your name is engraved on his hand. And it's his testimony who moves the heart of the Father. 
You have a Redeemer who heals that feeling of separation. Because you have a Redeemer who with nail-scarred hands stands between the two of you. But you also have a Redeemer who Job goes on to say deals with more than just separation, guys. He deals with the sorrow, with the pain that we have in this life. Because Job says about that Redeemer who he knows lives, in the end, that Redeemer, he says, will triumph over the dust. Now that's fun. Your English translations say he will stand on the earth, but the Hebrew literally says, in the end, after Job dies. Catch that. You want to talk about faith. Job says, I won't see this triumph in my lifetime, but I'm still going to see this triumph. He says, in the end, after I am no more, long after this pain has passed, my Redeemer is going to triumph. He is going to have victory over the dust. The dust has been a powerful image for Job. If you remember chapter 2, Job is sitting in the dust. And we talked how chapter 2, Job sitting in the dust, scraping the boils uh, outside of the city, probably on the trash heap. Is a, it's a picture of living hell. Job says, my God, my Redeemer, is going to triumph over hell and over this hell that I have to live. But Job continues that image of dust throughout the whole book of Job. He is going to say, I'm going to return to dust. So for Job, dust is the literal hell he's living in. It's the grave he's returning to. It is the death that will one day overtake him. It's hell and grave and death. And Job says there's going to come a day in the end when my Redeemer, who stands between me and the Father, my Redeemer, whose testimony makes the Father's heart tender towards me and can make my heart tender towards the Father, there will come a day where he's not just dealing with the separation, he's going to deal with the sorrow, and he's going to end it. Period. Now, Job had to do that by faith. You get to do that with facts. Because you know that your Redeemer, 2,000 years ago, came to this dust and he walked this earth. And your Redeemer experienced every bit of sorrow that any human being ever will. He knows what it is to be mistaken, or misunderstood, rather, to be betrayed. He knows what it is to be beaten. He, he knows what a common cold feels like. But he also knows what it is to die. But on the third day, your Redeemer triumphed over the dust. And he defeated hell. And he defeated his own grave. And he defeated death. The battle, the war is over, even though we're still dealing with the battles. And what that means is that one day, one day, at the end, your Redeemer is coming back. And on that day, friends, he will totally triumph over the dust. And that's why Scripture says that there will be a day where there will no longer be sorrow. There will no longer be sighing. There will no longer be dying. There will no longer be pain. That day is coming. And you, believer, get to hold on to it. You get to look at nail-scarred hands and not just know that there is a tender testimony that turns the heart of the Father towards you, but those same nail-scarred hands have guaranteed there will be total triumph. It's real. And one day it's coming. But I'm also aware that those promises, as powerful as they are, can kind of feel like a pipe dream. Someday, maybe, I hope. And Job says, no, no. The tender testimony of your Redeemer and the total triumph he has won over the dust, they point to a tremendous truth. And this one's worth just walking through slow. He says, after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, don't miss that. Listen, Job's flesh is a big deal. Because from the top of his head to the bottoms of his feet, Job is living with boils that are painful and cracked and oozing. That Job can't even be touched. Like his wife can't give him a hug. He's in that kind of pain. And Job says, okay, this skin, this body that is falling apart is one day going to be utterly destroyed. I will return to the dust and you know what happens there. Yet, 
in my flesh. He does not say, yet in my spirit, yet in my greatest hopes and dreams. He says, in my flesh. Now think about that. On the one hand, guys, it means that I am utterly convinced I am going to eat the tastiest chocolate and drink the best coffee when I get to heaven. Amen. Mm. And there's no calories. I'm just saying, I am going to go on the greatest adventures I've ever been on. Like, Can you just picture what heaven is going to be like? It is absolute, utter perfection. I get to explore the depths of the ocean and the highest mountain peaks because I'm going to be in heaven, and I'll be there in my flesh. I get to get a hug from Jesus because I'm going to be there in my flesh. Uh, My uh, grandfather who gave his life to Christ literally on his deathbed is going to greet me, and I will beat that man at cards. (laughs) I had to wait till heaven. (laughs) because I'm going in my flesh. But then you ought to think also what Job is saying. His flesh is literally being destroyed, and he said, but one day it's, it will be restored. See, I think Job means both things here. I, in my flesh, one day have a promise of a very embodied experience for all of eternity in the presence of my God. And in that experience, everything that has been taken from me by sorrow will be restored. All of it. This morning in Sunday school class, we were talking about what you need if you face justice. And we used the example of a woman who had been raped. And if percentages are right, there are women in here who have been. And one of the things we talked about was that there's nothing the court system can ever give anybody who's experienced something like that that will ever give you back the feeling of being safe. Nothing the courts can do will ever give you back a sense of, that your body is yours, but in your flesh. Whatever's been stolen from you because of sorrow on this side of glory will be given back. That's your promise. And it is your promise because you have a redeemer whose tender testimony about you is that it ain't about you, it's about what he did whose tender testimony is that he loves you and he says you are his. His tender testimony is that he does have one hand on you and one hand on the Father, and he's not letting go. This promise is yours because he triumphed, and one day will totally triumph. You will, in the flesh, everything that is broken, be restored. And he says, after his skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. And apparently, that didn't get it done. So he said, no, really, I myself will see him. And it still wasn't enough. And so he says, with my own eyes. I think Job was dancing at this point. (laughs) One day, you, if you are in Jesus Christ, will stand before God the Father and you will look at perfect holiness in the eye. And you won't have to shield your eyes. And you know what? Perfect love won't avert his eyes from you. There will be a day in the flesh with your eyes, you will see God face to face. And you know what else? Your eyes will from that moment only ever see goodness and beauty. Your eyes will only ever see perfection. They will never, ever see injustice or pain or futility. Your eyes, if they weep, will only weep because of joy. This is your promise. In the flesh, you will see. And look at what you're going to see. I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not a stranger. And most of your English translations say I am not another. Like, I'm going to see God and not, you know, somebody he likes more. The Hebrew actually says I, not a stranger. Job, over and over again, has been calling himself a stranger. Over and over, he's saying, I feel so separated from God that not only is God a stranger to me, but I think I'm a stranger to him. I don't think he knows me, cares about me. I think I'm the guy that just passes on the street who God ignores. But he also talks about how he feels like a stranger to himself. Been there? Like Job's experiencing so much incredible grief that he will say, I don't even know who I am anymore. I'm a stranger to me. But Job says there will come a day 
when in the flesh, everything broken, restored, you will see God. You, and not a stranger. I think when Job takes his first breath in glory after the end, when there's total triumph, that Job is going to come up to God the Father, and the Father is going to say, Job, welcome home. And then he's going to turn to the heavenly court and say, this is him. This is the guy I've been telling you about. Because Job's not a stranger. But friends, that also means that on the day that you stand in glory, that's what God's going to say. He's going to say, hey, here's Frank. Welcome home. Welcome home, my good and faithful servant. And he's going to turn around and say, this is the one I've been telling you about. I love him the most. And then he's going to say, Charlie, and Madeline, and Logan, and Eric. And he's going to say every person's name because you're not a stranger to him. And in that moment, you won't be a stranger to you either. And he's going to welcome you into his presence. And you will hear good and done. You have done well, my good and faithful servant. Job says, my heart yearns within me for that day. And my heart yearns within me for you and I to believe these truths. Too often we try to deal with the separation that we feel, the sorrow that is so big by resigning ourselves to it, slap on the smile, and just suck it up. And we leave a cold and distant relationship between us and God. Or we try desperately to reform ourselves, always afraid, always afraid, that we haven't done enough. And what we most need is the absolute conviction that there is a Redeemer who heals the separation and the sorrow, who does it through a tender testimony, total triumph, and a tremendous truth. And we're going to invite the band to go ahead and start making their way up here as we get ready to come to this table. This table that proves to you what your Redeemer has done. But as we do, I want to give a couple invitations. First, if you don't know Jesus Christ, you can sit in a church your entire life, never believing that Jesus really does have your name engraved on his hand, never believing that his triumph is complete and total, never agreeing with him that this truths change your life today. If you don't know Jesus, then today is the day to say yes to the Redeemer who wants with everything within him to show you how real his love is. But if you're like me and you're like Job, and you know Jesus, and you even affirm these truths and forget them all the time, then I'm going to invite you in these next few moments to come before your Savior, your Redeemer, and pray. If what you need to be reminded of today is that there is a tender testimony, you have a Savior who has engraved your name on his nail-scarred hands, and you need to just see him with one hand on you and one hand on the Father, then would you ask him to show you how his testimony changes the Father's heart towards you and yours about the Father? If you need to be reminded today that there will be an end to the sorrow and you can trust Jesus, he's accomplished it, and he will one day do it, then ask him to show you that. And if today you just need to say, Lord, Show me the truth. In my flesh, with my eyes, I am not a stranger. Will one day see you. Then ask him to show you. Because these are the truths that change how we live today. Let's come before our God in prayer. Jesus, I thank you that there is a Redeemer. It's one hand on me and one hand on the Father. And it's a nail-scarred hand. I thank you, Jesus, that there is this absolute, utter assurance that we get to grab hold of when we feel forgotten or forsaken that we cannot be because you've engraved our names on your hand. And I ask today, Holy Spirit, as we prepare to come to your table, 
we prepare to hold the, the symbols of broken body and poured out blood in our hands, that this day you would confirm in our hearts what the Redeemer has done and is doing. And that by your grace, Lord, we would allow you to heal whatever separation, whatever sorrow we feel, because we know what you have covered. We know the promises that are to come. And I thank you that you are a God who's so incredibly faithful that you grab us by the hand, even while we still hurt. And you hold us until that day when with our eyes, all we see is good. Jesus, thanks for loving us. We pray these things in your name, Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.